Electricity reigns supreme in our modern world. Its presence is pervasive and has an almost boundless array of applications, spanning transportation, heating, illumination, communication, and computation. While the study of electrical phenomena has ancient roots, substantial theoretical comprehension didn't emerge until the 17th and 18th centuries. It wasn't until the late 19th century that electricity found practical utility in industrial and residential settings, sparking the transformation that has shaped the society we recognize today. As many are likely aware or have painfully experienced, our planet is inhabited by creatures capable of generating their own electricity, and among the most infamous of these creatures is the infamous electric eel. However, considering that electricity is a relatively recent discovery, and eels are believed to have existed on Earth for approximately 60 to 70 million years, it raises a simple question. What were electric eels called before electricity? Electric eels, or Electrophorus electricus, are a species of fish that are native to the Amazon and Orinoco basins in South America. They are called electric eels because they are able to generate electric shocks as a means of self-defense in hunting. Around there somewhere. Oh! You got the bottom of the net? Yeah. Bring the bottom of the net Oh! Damn! I felt it! I felt it! Oh! Yes, he's there! He's right over there! He's right over there! Idea, idea. No! I don't like that, man. That's bad. No, yeah, I felt it! Idea, idea. He's got me. Wet myself, man, that's bad! Electric eels are elongated, serpentine fish that can grow up to 2.4 meters in length and weigh up to 20 kilograms. However, not all eels are made equal, and contrary to popular belief, unless you reside in South America, all eels you meet are not electric and are essentially harmless, with the exception of a few species that rely on distinct ways of assault. Yet, for the South Americans, sorry. But luckily, there are just three species of electric eels found in the Amazon River or its tributaries. Electric eel, or Electrophorus electricus, Avari's electric eel, or Electrophorus vari, and Volta's electric eel, or Electrophorus volti. The most well known of the three is the electric eel, which can deliver shocks of up to 860 volts. However, contrary to its name, the electric eel is a knife fish, not an eel. It belongs to the order Genotiformes, and is closely related to carp and catfish. Obviously, the electric eel gets its name from its eel like body, and unlike actual eels, which dwell largely in salt water, Electric eels reside in South America in largely freshwater environments. Electric eels are also air breathers, which means they must surface every 10 minutes to breathe, as opposed to true eels, who can breathe underwater with gills. It should also be noted that aside from the infamous South American electric eels, there exist other species of electric fish, with notable examples including the electric catfish or Malapteroridae found in Africa's Nile River, which delivers a shock of up to 350 volts, and the common torpedo or torpedo torpedo, found in the Mediterranean, which delivers a shock of up to 200 volts. Though they are from different regions of the world, these electric fish produce the same numbing effects to those who dare draw near. Because of their numbing properties, these electric fish were noted and extensively utilized as medicinal remedies in both ancient Rome and China, while tribes in South America employed electric eels in the same way. As an ancient Greek living along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, Greek physician Hippocrates was familiar with the Mediterranean torpedo or electric ray, and after noting their numbing effects, dubbed them narco, which comes from the ancient Greek word varko, which means to make numb. This is where we got the term narcotic, which refers to a drug or other chemical that alters mood or behavior, and more crucially, narcosis, which was a description of the fish's numbing effect on anyone who came in touch with it. When these ancient Greco-Roman naturalists sought to figure out what was creating such a reaction, they assumed it was a type of poison. The definitive link between the discharge of these fish and electricity was not established until the 1740s, with the discovery and invention of Leyden jars, independently by German cleric Ewald Georg von Kleist and by Dutch scientist Peter van Muschelbroek of Leyden, hence the name Leyden jar. A Leyden jar is an electrical component that stores a high voltage electric charge from an external source between electrical conductors on the inside and outside of a glass jar. In other words, it is essentially a capacitor for storing static energy and was the first method of storing and retaining enormous amounts of electric charge that could be released at one's discretion. Naturalist Bertrand Bajon, a French military surgeon in French Guyana, and the Jesuit Ramon Tamaya in South America's River Plate Basin, conducted early research on the numbing discharges of South America's electric eels in the 1760s, which cemented further the link between these fish and electricity. A few years later, in 1766, Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus officially categorized the eels as Gymnotus electricus, placing it in the same genus as Gymnotus carapo, or banded knifefish, 
which he had described several years earlier. It was only about a century later, in 1864, that the electric eels moved to its own genus, Electrophorus, by American ichthyologist Theodore Gill. Nonetheless, this is the first time the electric eel is mentioned. British scientist John Walsh researched the electric ray or torpedo in 1775, and both species were dissected by British surgeon and anatomist John Hunter. Hunter informed the Royal Society that, quote, Junotus electricus appears very much like an eel, but it has none of the specific properties of that fish. He observed that there were, quote, two pairs of these organs, a larger and a smaller, one being placed on each side, and that they occupied, quote, perhaps more than one third of the whole animal. Also in 1775, American founding father and politician Hugh Williamson, who had studied with Hunter, presented a paper titled Experiments and Observations on the Gymnotus Electricus or Electric Eel to the Royal Society. Williamson reported a series of experiments, such as, quote, in order to discover whether the eel killed those fish by an emission of the same fluid with which he affected my hand when I touched him, I put my hand into the water, at some distance from the eel. Another catfish was thrown into the water, the eel swam up to it. Gave it a shock, by which it instantly turned up its belly, it continued motionless. At that very instant, I felt such a sensation in the joint of my fingers as an experiment for. End quote. Instead of putting my hand into the water, at a distance from the eel, as in the last experiment, I touched its tail, so as not to offend it. While my assistant touched its head more roughly, we both received a severe shock. In the 18th century, study of these peculiar fish and their organs contributed to European knowledge of electricity. In 1799, Italian chemist Alessandro Volta invented the voltaic pile, which was described by Volta as an artificial replication of the natural organs of animal electricity found in Gymnotus electricus. This discovery triggered heated disputes in the 18th century, regarding whether electricity was primarily an animal phenomenon or a physical one. At this time, there were only a few natural occurrences linked with what we now call electricity in a pre-industrial world. They were as follows, animals that produced electric shocks, static electricity commonly caused by some form of organic matter, and lightning. Along with this study establishing the eel's electrical nature came a first-hand report in 1800 by German explorer Alexander von Humboldt, who while travelling through modern-day South America, accompanied a group of indigenous people who went fishing with horses, 30 of which they chased into the water. The pounding of the horse's hooves, he observed, forced the fish, which were up to 1.5 metres long, out of the muck, and urged them to attack, rising out of the water and shocking the horses. He witnessed two horses being startled by the shocks and subsequently drowning. The electric eels, having given many shocks, quote, now require long rest and plenty of nourishment to replace the loss of galvanic power they have suffered and swam timidly to the bank of the pond. They were then readily captured with little harpoons attached to the ropes. The locals, according to Humboldt, did not consume the electrified organs, and they dreaded the fish so much that they would not fish for them in the traditional method. Yet, Humboldt failed to record the word they used to name these electric eels, and like many men of the era, used the Latin name Gymnotus electricus, created by well-renowned Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus in 1766 to describe the animal. But surely Carl Linnaeus knew a name for the animal before his label Gymnotus electricus. The original description of Gymnotus electricus was made by Linnaeus in 1766 in his book Systema Naturae, 12th edition. The text was written in Latin, which sadly is partly obscured, but reads, quote, Trembling torpedo, whence the limbs are rattling to the touch with pain, such as from the bruising of the elbow, so that the person can be thrown down, especially from the larger fish, and the lower limb has not been recently weakened by a second touch and stroke. The strike feels painful to the touch, although the handle is metal, mostly orange, and on placing the vessel, a tremor was felt by the fingers of the water being inserted, but not by the touch of sealing wax. The force appropriated the diseases of the drowsy nightmare to be drowned. See Grenovius. The head is sprinkled with pierced dots. Except for the mention of the name Torpedo, a name which refers to electric rays, not eels, there remains no reference to what it was called before its classification from Notus Electricus. It seems all roads lead to the name Gymnotus Electricus, which in 1864 then became Electrophorus Electricus thanks to Theodore Gill. But alas, all is not lost, for through research I have found possible names that came before Gymnotus Electricus, for the wide variety of electric fish found across the world. Tamanaku, a now extinct Caribbean language from Venezuela, is one probable origin of a name prior to Gymnotus Electricus. Filippo Salvatore Gilli, an Italian Jesuit priest who lived in the province of Venezuela, now in present-day central Venezuela, and lived among the Tamanaku for 20 years, wrote the first Tamanaku word list in 1780. This list revealed that in Tamanaku, there is a word for electric eels, Arimna, 
or that which deprives of motion, which is coincidentally similar to the Naku etymologies mentioned previously. The Tupi people, like the Tamanaku, inhabited South America and lived across almost all of Brazil's coast when the Portuguese first arrived in 1500. They numbered nearly 1 million people and were divided into tribes, each tribe numbering from 300 to 2,000 people. There was not a unified Tupi identity, despite the fact that they spoke a common language. In the Tupi language, they called electric eels potocare, which meant that which makes sleep, or that which numbs, a term that is also coincidentally similar to the narco etymologies mentioned previously. It's also worth mentioning the word torpedo, a term mentioned previously and comes from the Latin word torpeo, which means stiff, numb or lifeless, and is a genus commonly applied to electric rays. Pliny the Elder was an ancient Roman naturalist and author of Naturalis Historia or Natural History, a collection of various information about all imaginable aspects of nature which mentions the strange effect that the torpedo genus appears to have on other living beings. From the same sea of the torpedo, that even from afar, and only touched by a spear or a stick, numbs even the strongest arm and binds the fastest running feet. Let only the smell and a certain aura of his body affect the members. Pliny appears to explain this bizarre phenomenon as something that emanates from its breath or emanations from its body, and is therefore capable of affecting human limbs. Of course, the word torpedo is also the name for an underwater ranged weapon, launched above or below the water's surface, and self-propels towards a target. The word torpedo was applied to weaponry during the Napoleonic Wars, by American inventor Robert Fulton, a man who invented the first commercially successful steamboat, the North River Steamboat, the first practical submarine, the Nautilus, and the world's earliest naval torpedoes. Fulton called them torpedo since it referred to a fish that emits an electrical discharge that disables its enemies. The last major example is found in Arabic, where the previously stated electric catfish or Malapterority was termed rad in Arabic, meaning thunderer or shaker, as testified to by a 12th century Arabic physician whose name I couldn't discover, but Malapterority are catfish, not eels, so the name is unlikely. Of course, this has nothing to do with the answer, but throughout my research, I came across an intriguing fact about electric eels. Afra Ben, writer of a 1688 novel called Oronoko, which is set in Suriname, describes the electric eel as a numb eel, introducing the species to European audiences. Alongside this, Ben is sometimes considered as the first known professional female writer, and Oronoko, published less than a year before her death, is sometimes referred to as one of the earliest novels in English. So, to answer the age-old question, what were electric eels called before electricity, we simply don't know, and it seems in a way, electric eels were not invented until Carl Linnaeus gave it the name Gymnotus Electricus in 1766. And it seems the name hasn't changed much since 1864, when it became Electrophorus Electricus thanks to Theodore Gill. This has been me, Jack, and if you ask me, before electric eels, there were steam-powered eels.